Hey, Dan, I, I just read your latest election column. I mean, man, I got to tell you, you really nailed that one. Like, tell me, like, you know so much about the issues and the way government works. Have you ever thought, I don't know, like running for office? Well, now that you mention it, it has crossed my mind once or twice. Actually, you know, mostly just for fun, I've been working on a 73-point campaign platform just in case I suddenly feel the need to, you know, jump into politics. That That's that's what you do for fun? Yeah, for sure. Uh, listen, you, you want to hear the highlights? All right. Okay, lay it on me. Well, listen, first, I introduce a guaranteed income program to massively reduce... Wow, our- Dan really does know his stuff. But the guy's got no charisma. I mean, he's a total policy wonk. Uh, in, in the dictionary under the word nerd, you probably find a picture of Dan. He talks so much. So, so much. I, I don't know when he takes a breath, even. It's like mansplaining run amok. He's knowledgeable, but if he tried to run for office, it'd be a disaster. Center ...and Walmart parking lots. Hey, are you even listening to my campaign? Like, what do you think? Well, you you definitely know your stuff, but um, but but what? I, I honestly believe, as a politician, you'd make a pretty good newspaper columnist. The Winnipeg Free Press proudly presents, in partnership with CJNU ninety three point seven FM, Nigan and the Lone Ranger. Here are your hosts, Negan Sinclair and Dan the Lone Ranger Let. One of the, the great advantages we have uh, being in the news media and covering election campaigns is it allows us to reach out, reach deep into our networks of contacts uh, in an effort to find out what's really going on in the campaign, behind the scenes. We are absolutely packed today. Full. It's a full room today. It's a full room today. This is uh, our uh, insiders panel for the Manitoba general election. Uh, joining me today, uh, Erin Selby was an NDP MLA from 2007 to 2015. She's a former Minister of Health. Before that, she was a in the broadcast uh, in, um, industry. She now works in uh, for a union. Uh, Don Plett, who I affectionately know as the plumber, uh, because of his incredibly successful uh, career in the HVAC and plumbing business before he got involved in politics. He's also, though, an independent senator for Manitoba, a former president of the Conservative Party of Canada, and a guy who knows where all the bodies are buried in several parties. It's quite amazing. And um, uh, for our liberal insider, Hannah Mihaichek Marshall uh, has really grown up in and around politics. Her mother, Marianne Mihaichek, uh, was an NDP MLA and a Liberal Member of Parliament. Uh, she's also uh, worked uh, for many years now for the Liberal Party of Canada as a field organizer, and she's currently on the staff of uh, Winnipeg South uh, MP Terry Duguid. Um, so welcome, everybody. And uh, thanks. I know that everybody, everybody's got that look on their face, like right before they get to the top of the roller coaster. And <laughs> even though you've done, you've done it before, you don't really know what it's going to feel like when that roller coaster starts. Like that's kind of what's going on. No, it's on. a starting gate, Dan. It is the starting gate. And we're like, open the gate. Let's go. Well, like, I think this whole you know, for provincial jumping, election yeah. is a bit feeling like that too. I mean, we're yeah. all kind of trying to figure out what's going to happen next, and uh, we're very excited to have you give our your insight on what's happened so far. I should mention that uh, despite the fact that our panelists all have uh, deep and obvious partisan connections, none of them are currently involved in the provincial campaigns. Is that correct, Don? That is correct. I have no official role in the provincial campaign. Well, and it's, I know many Tories that are sorry that you don't have an official Well, role and even campaign. though you did uh, affectionately <laughs> introduce me as an independent senator, I do at least for the record need to say I am a proud conservative senator. You, you, uh, yes, that's uh, right. <laughs> that displays my independence every so I, often. <laughs> I said independent senator because you asked me to, but I knew it was wrong. <laughs> like, I felt it was just wrong. So... Um, okay, uh, you know, basically, I'm going to ask everybody the same question, uh, and it'll give you a chance to, we're mostly going to be reflecting on your own party's place in the election, performance in the election. So, Aaron, we, I'm going to have you go first. 
the biggest strength you think the NDP have demonstrated so far in the campaign? I mean, we're only a week into it. Our biggest strength right now is Heather Stephenson and the conservative record, frankly. Um, people are mad. People are scared. People are worried about affordability. They're worried about health care. They've seen a lot of um, things go downhill in the last few years. So really, our biggest strength is we're running against a party that right now people don't trust and don't like. So what is the biggest challenge right now for the NDP? Where, where have they maybe struggled a little bit or it's something that they're going to have to overcome from this point on? I had an interesting conversation over the weekend with a friend who defines himself as a small C conservative. Uh, was a supporter of mine, but I think that's the only time in his life he's ever voted anything other than conservative. And he said to me, you know, I'm, I'm kind of scared to have Wob as premier. I'm nervous about it. I'm scared of it. And I said, okay, well, what are you scared of? And he paused for a minute and he thought and he said, I don't know. And so I asked him, okay, dig really deep. Do you think it's because he's an indigenous man? Is there anything in that? And he was honest enough to say, yeah, I, I think there is some of that. So I think um, we will certainly see racism play a part in this election. I don't think it's the majority. I don't think it's the biggest thing that it's going to make people's decision. But um, I was surprised that, that this person had this conversation with me at all. Well, that's certainly come up a, a number of times in our, in our conversation and also... Uh uh, Dan and I've been talking about the emails that we've been getting about this election campaign, but let's move over to Dawn here. Uh, what do you think is the biggest, uh, um, the strongest, the biggest strength of the Conservative campaign so far? Well, I have to agree with Aaron. I think one of the biggest strengths that we have right now is Heather Stephenson. Uh, so we <laughs> Agreement. Certainly, Agreement. We certainly agree on something. <laughs> Heather has done an amazing job of putting together a great team. That is indeed one of her strengths, reaching out, reaching across to all parts of our party. Uh, as we all know, we came through a fairly uh, divisive uh, leadership uh, campaign not that long ago, provincially, uh, that Heather won. And Heather has reached across all parts of our party to put together an incredible team. Uh, we, we absolutely know that... Uh, that our team is the strongest as a team, um, and I'm certainly uh, I'm certainly happy that there are people that feel nervous about voting for Wab Canoe, not because he's an indigenous. The only people who are making this a racist issue is, in fact, the NDP. The reason people are nervous about voting for Wab Canoe is because of Greg Salinger and the NDP past record. So I would say our biggest strength by far and out is that we have a very, very strong team. And uh, I think we'll get back to that question because it seems to be coming up now already very early around race. But let's let's just, what's, what do you think is the biggest challenge that the Conservatives are facing in this election campaign, either so far or uh, potentially on the horizon? Well, one of the challenges uh, is very clearly whenever we criticize the NDP, race seems to be brought in by by others, not by us. Um, it's very difficult to attack Wab Canoe without even Wab Canoe making comments like, well, I occasionally have a ponytail. Uh, this is not about race. This is about this is about the capabilities, uh, about being able to lead. Uh, I don't think we have any proof there that he has been able to. Um, we have run incredible deficits with the NDP uh, government and and I think that is going to uh, really play out the other the other difficulty that the conservatives have had is quite frankly taking some of the credit publicly for what they have done in the last number of years having come having formed government after being in opposition for so many years and straightening out uh, certainly financially getting the province uh, back on right track, uh, looking towards a balanced budget coming up. And, uh, and so um, we need to take credit and we need to make sure that the people of Manitoba know where we have come over the last half dozen years. And the, the Liberal Party in Manitoba has um, uh, a slightly different 
set of challenges facing it because, you know, certainly uh, for the better part of, well, over 30 years now, the Liberals have had trouble finding traction with voters. Uh, they've been up to four seats. They've traditionally been around two seats. So what what do you think uh, is uh, the biggest strength of the Liberal campaign or yeah, the Liberal campaign so far? And then what is the big challenge going forward? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, salut, anime, bonjour. I'm so excited to be here <laughs> with you guys. It really is an honor to be amongst such incredible panelist with so much experience and I'm I'm very grateful for the opportunity and I think I think that almost you can draw a parallel between that and the current Manitoba Liberal Party as you know a bit of an underdog a little bit untested in the terms of they haven't had a chance to form government and um I think you know, that can be a challenge. Of course, I'll speak to that after, but it's also a strength. We're giving Manitobans not just, oh, we're not the other guys. Remember Salinger? Oh, remember Pallister? You don't like them. So instead of just giving people something to be scared of, something to vote against, we're giving people something to vote for. And I think that's evident in the fact that we've already released a fully costed platform. We are the only party to do that right out of the gate because we have nothing to hide. This is what the Manitoba Liberal Party is. Mm -hmm. It is level-headed, it is reasonable, and it can be trusted. Where I think Manitobans have some trust issues, frankly, and maybe aren't comfortable with giving a majority government to either of the two major parties at that point. So I think this is a real opportunity. That doesn't mean it's not an uphill battle. Of course it is being the third um, third place with only three seats currently. It's going to be a challenge, but it's a challenge that I think Dougald Lamont has um, really embraced. And he is working hard to prove to Manitobans that they are safe to put their mm-hmm. trust in a third option that we don't have to have a two-party system like we're the United States, right? We, we don't need that. And, um, and he knows that it's, it's an ongoing process, but I think, um, our track record, even just the last two by-elections was a really fantastic momentum. It showed that this, you have an actual third option. You don't have to just vote against one, then vote against the other, flip-flop the entire time. So um, I see huge potential mm-hmm. for um, really being that that um, that opportunity for Manitobans who might not feel like they have a voice with either of the two major parties at this point. So I think it's it's um, it's always interesting uh, asking uh, people with a partisan lens to analyze their own strengths and weaknesses. And, and I think you guys all did like really good answers. Uh, but I, you know, so I'm, but I am going to go back and kind of hit on a couple of points again. So, you know, and Don, you'll stop me if I'm being too hyperbolic. I know that you're, you're good at helping me keep my hyper, <laughs> hyperbole well, in we, check. We you all know? need to help occasionally. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think that, um, and I'll even acknowledge that I think most governments are actually kind of bad at positioning their successes. Like it is like, I think that's a challenge of governing when you're governing and you're doing good things and bad things, you're constantly fighting fires on the bad things. And often that kind of sucks the oxygen out of being able to say, yeah, but you know, we did this and that I'm wondering, you know, if we can be, uh, you know, fair and honest for a moment though, the, the years that Brian Pallister was leading, um, the party, it, it, it did, he did take the party to, fairly significant lows in terms of, uh, of uh, opinion, poll, support, and personal popularity. And I, I think it might be a little too simplistic to say that was just because Brian didn't do a good enough job of blowing his own horn because you and I both know Brian quite well. <laughs> and I don't really think that's one of his major weaknesses. Uh, but, you know, you know him even better than I do. It, so, let you know, really, uh, health care, um, Budget austerity, which is, you know, is certainly drawn a lot of uh, attention uh, from people who are worried about health care and education and others. I mean, is there is there something to the criticism that's been leveled at the government? Uh, listen, um, anytime you are trying to clean up somebody else's mess, 
there has to be difficult choices made. Healthcare uh, didn't get to where it is in the last six years. It has taken years to get health care to the dismal shape that it is in today. It will take uh, some years to bring it back. The Conservatives have a great plan uh, to bring it back. They have already uh, done a tremendous job uh, of bringing a lot of health care professionals uh, back to the province. They are continuing. They have signed agreements with the uh, Philippine uh, government uh, or with the, to, to, to bring uh, health care professionals over. Uh, we are not talking about Brian Pellister now. You're, you, you mentioned that but he has a person. You said he has a personal <laughs> popularity uh, problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, he is no longer there. Um, so it's the Conservative Party that I'm talking about. And, and Brian Pellister made difficult choices. Brian Pellister, uh, became fairly unpopular, as did the, the, uh, the party in, in, in certain areas, which was largely, uh, precipitated by a pandemic that we've never had before. What provincial government in the last three or four years was popular? Look what happened in Alberta. Look what happened in Ontario. This is across the board that these things happen. So uh, we can sit here and point fingers. And when I talk about Greg Salinger, yep. uh, I'll talk about Gary Dewar as well, who who is actually, uh, I have quite, a fond relationship with Gary Dewar. Nevertheless, the NDP ran deficits for 17 years. They brought our health care into the dismal shape that it is. And you are right, Dan, there's problems there. It will take a lot of years to bring it back. I think we're on track to do that. So, uh, Aaron, I'll say objectively, uh, the last year of NDP government uh, under Greg Selinger was a bit of a dumpster fire. I'm not saying you're going to say that, but it is, I should know. I think know, my feelings are pretty No, No, I was, I was I going to say for, for <laughs> listeners, Aaron was one of five cabinet ministers who did resign in 2015, a year before the election, uh, to protest uh, Premier Selinger's leadership. Which so, says a lot about Aaron and also a lot about Greg Selinger. Absolutely. But I, I'm also, yeah, I'm also, you know, going to give Aaron a chance to sort of respond because – the uh, I'm not. First of all, I'll say I'm not sure. 17 years of deficits is entirely correct. It's but not. we're actually not. We're not doing fact check. <laughs> we'll have another episode to fact check uh, history on this thing. But okay. So the la- the last year, year and a half, was pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is it fair to say, like, did did you guys? hand the dumpster to the Tories and they just couldn't put out the fire? Is that a fair analysis? I don't think it's fair. And okay, I'm going to give you some numbers, but not ones that you'll have to debate with me, I don't think. So if you look at Manitoba's budget, in fact, you can look at pretty much, I'd say it's true for all the for all the provinces, is almost 50% of the provincial budget of Manitoba goes into health care. When you break that down, it's like 80% goes into salaries. So if you want to make major cuts in Manitoba, if you want to say austerity government, austerity government, you have to cut people in health care. And that's what they did. They took federal health transfers. And instead of moving that money into health care, they used it to give tax breaks for people who did all right all the way through the pandemic. So um, health care is a challenge. And, you know, we can talk about the feds not coming to the table to their fair share, but that's not what our topic is about. But if you're talking about cutting, if you're ever talking about scaling back in order to make any impact on a provincial budget, you have to look at health care. And that means you're cutting people, which is what they did. Now they're trying to backfill, but we still haven't got to the numbers that we had before they came in and started cutting. And I, I think we'll acknowledge too that the pandemic was an unparalleled existential threat and you know and but uh, and again just to fact check Doug Ford remarkably came through that like in incredible shape and we hope to have him on the podcast soon to find out how he did that um Hannah you, you mentioned and you volunteered that the one of the advantages and or disadvantages the liberals face is they don't have a record uh so you don't have a record to defend uh, and you can't point to any performance, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Dr. Gerard and Dugald and uh, Cindy, they've all been there watching what's going on. So, I mean, uh, so from a liberal perspective, is this about, again, 
about the Tories being handed the, uh, the, the flaming dumpster and, and not having enough time in six, seven years to fix it? Or is this, uh, as Aaron's described it, kind of a, uh, uh, situation wasn't that bad and austerity, uh, uh, progressive conservative austerity pushed us more closer to the brink. Where, where would you say the truth is? Um, I mean, I think there is truth, um, in both of what my fellow panelists said here, you know, I think it, it might be, um, a little bit about dodging responsibility on behalf of both governments. Of course, you want to paint the best light of your own track record, but we can't pretend that the NDP are responsible for the last seven years of healthcare in this province, right? But we also can't pretend that healthcare was awesome under the NDP. So I think that um, when we talk about track record, um, we also, you know, that's not something I can point to, like we um, were saying, but we do have Dr. John Gerard, who has been an exceptional advocate in terms of the health field. We also have our new candidate. Well, not even new. She ran in the by-election, but Rhonda Nickel, who is also a fantastic, uh, knowledgeable healthcare worker as we speak. Um, so I think that work that our party has done without even being in government has been exceptional in terms of health care. But we also do have to look to the future, and especially us as Manitoba liberals, we can point to our um, platform, right? We can also look at the um, recent article in the Free Press um, talking about the um, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives that frankly pokes holes in both the PCs and the NDP's arguments and finger pointing, it says that with the current fiscal plans, unfortunately, if the NDP were to get elected, there will have to be cuts in health care. There is no... Exactly, yeah. If you're keeping those tax cuts, if you're keeping the PCs fiscal policy, you will have to cut health care. So you can't be that advocate only pointing to the PCs if your own path forward right. suggests that you will be the exact same yeah. in terms of health care. That's an that's excellent point. Um, Ding on. Yeah. Aaron, um, <clears throat> I guess we've uh, been, we touched upon the issue and now uh, we've arrived at <laughs> what has been the kind of specter in this election uh, around race. And, uh, if we think back to kind of what is the seminal moment of this campaign, it was uh, Wab Canoe's speech at the Canadian Mennonite University. Uh, everyone uh, was invited. Uh, it was well talked about, certainly in NDP circles. Uh, and he said famously uh, that it was supposed to be a speech on crime, but it ended up being a lot, uh, partly about crime, but a lot about the uh, kind of specter of race in this election. And famously, he said, that the uh, conservatives don't want to talk about crime. They want to talk about the fact that I wear my hair in a braid. Uh, is this true? Is this what, what Don said just a few minutes ago, that the NDP is making this election about race? And uh, certainly, as you just pointed out in your own comments, that the electorate and the emails that we're getting at the Free Press are certainly making it about race. Are the NDP leading that conversation on race and making that about this uh, in this election? No, I think, uh, you know, as a party, we're much more interested in talking about health care and education and affordability. But um, you can't be running the first potential Indigenous premier in Canada. The First and not Nations that. premier, actually. I mean, yeah. we've had a Métis premier before, Louis Rail and so on. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Of course. But... Um, that this is this is big for Canada to see to see an indigenous man at that on that stage in that chair. And I think that, yeah, people are talking about it. I don't think I don't see Wob addressed uh, some things in that one in that one um, announcement, but I've heard him talking about health care a lot more and education and daycare and affordability. but I but it is coming up. I'm hearing it from people, and they certainly um, you certainly can detect that there's a tone. Uh, Don, there's these very famous bus uh, bus uh, bench ads throughout the whole city and, and TV, commercials. TV commercials. And it's really hard to, I mean, in fact, you would say that these commercials are probably seen more than the premier herself when it comes to the ads for this campaign. 
And it's specifically pointing to uh, that Wob, uh, not gesturing quite to his uh, past involvements with the law, but certainly suggesting that he would may be soft on crime, which he has said time and time again he would not, is that, I mean, the fact that this person who is on the bus ads pointing out that she's Métis, Rajon Caron, uh, is former police officer. Former police officer. Métis woman. Métis woman. You, you, Métis yeah. woman, that's right. Uh, you've said that the that the conservatives are not making it about race, but that those ads certainly seem to be making it about race. No, I think Rajon Caron very clearly was making the ad about being soft on crime. Rajon Caron is a strong, matey woman, police officer, mother, who is concerned about crime. And that is what the ad is about. Uh, the fact that the NDP have been soft on crime over the years is no small secret. The liberals have been soft on crime. The conservatives are the party on that wants to be tough on crime. That is what this ad was about. As Kelvin Gertson rightly pointed out, when you are running for the top job, when you are going to a job interview, you're going to be asked questions about your past. It has nothing to do with the fact that Wob is indigenous. It has to do with that he has somewhat of a shady uh, past. There have been charges laid. Yes, they were stayed, but his partner still hasn't recanted what was said, and I believe the people in Manitoba have the right to know who they are elected. And 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 Aaron is correct. It be a proud moment for, for, for the Indigenous community, for the province of Manitoba. It would also be a proud moment for the province of Manitoba to have the first woman premier elected which Heather still hasn't been. She's won a leadership race. She would also be the first woman ever elected premier in the province of Manitoba. So let's make this about the issues. Let's make this about, yes, the past of our leaders. If there is something in Heather's past that needs to be raised, let's raise it. There is issues about Wob's past, and that is what we're doing, and that is what Rajan is doing, and, and there is nothing on these bus ads that indicates anything other than let's be tough on crime. So I'm just I'm just wondering because I've always found the debate on the tough on crime debate to be frustrating to cover as a journalist because honestly I believe I don't believe governments are responsible for the rise and fall in crime. I mean you can you know, pass laws, change sentencing, um, you know, uh, introduce progressive alternative ways of dealing with people that run into trouble. But, you know, largely, I think, and, you know, and uh, I know this is a visual thing, but put put your hand up if you think <laughs> crime is not largely driven by macro socioeconomic forces that are a lot of that are beyond the, the, the control of government, mental health, addiction, poverty, things that got like it, it, it would be impossible. I won't raise no, 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 but I disagree with you. No, okay. But and, and I mean, largely all controlled by government. Okay. But no, okay. But it, those are things that government's involved in, but in terms of, um, you know, really mental health and addictions, we can treat people. Right. We can try to give them a way out. But, you know, we can't really control the number of people who fall prey to them. Why? Like, why do we have a crisis in mental health right now? Well, the pandemic had a big part to do with it. The the evolution of the kind of drugs that are that are available on the street. I mean, government like Cuts it's to the social support instead programs. Of dealing, instead of dealing with those drug issues, Dan, we want to legalize more drug problems. Okay, but but Don, so, I would so sort there, of say there is things the government you're, can you're, do. There is issues the government can okay. do. They can put criminals behind bars keep them there for longer periods of time. And yes, absolutely, if there are mental or health issues, let's deal with okay, them. Okay, so, uh, so using that as a platform then, the government that's promising or claiming that uh, the party that we're the best on to, to, to be tough on crime is accusing the NDP, the, the best I'd say, that violent crime will be out of control if an NDP government is is uh, elected, but you're also the government that's overseen a huge spike, like it's on your watch, 
that there's been a huge spike in violent crime. So I tried to let you guys off the hook, but now that you think the government's in control of these things, then I'll put it on you. Yeah, that was, that was a tiger trap. No, no. But I mean, seriously, like, so, but why? And it's always the same thing, right? Like around election time, everybody competes to sort of like, they're going to have the, the, the best solutions. But the fact is that like, are we not experiencing right now a bit of a crisis in violent crime? Well, who is the government and who's been the government for seven years? So if it's in your control, like, why didn't the Tories fix it? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a national issue to, to mm -hmm. some extent. Provinces problem clearly, yeah. clearly have a part in it, yeah. but it is a national issue. We're right now, uh, on the federal scene, uh, working with, with, with gun legislation. Um, uh, we're working right now, as you already mentioned, um, with, with an opioid, opioid crisis. Um, we believe that there are ways of dealing with that, that clearly is, is different from what the, the NDP believe and certainly, uh, federally from what the liberals believe. And so there are ways of dealing with this. This, this, uh, got worse during the pandemic and a good part of our tenure has been during the pandemic. So, uh, has that increased in the last couple of years? Without a doubt, Dan. And it is something that the conservatives do not just talk about tough on crime during elections. They talk about tough on crime 24-7. And unfortunately, not enough about compassion and safe injection sites. Uh, you know, and compassion is my whole other, like, line of questioning that's coming up. Uh, Hannah, um, like, I, I don't want to get off race. I want to finish off the kind of give you an opportunity. Uh, if you think back just a few months ago on what is the what was the most... A pivotal kind of moment um, when it came to talking about race wasn't really about Wabet that came in at university. It certainly wasn't about um, anything other than the issue around the landfill. And of course, the, uh, the remains of women that are at the landfill site, uh, the protests that took place. And it was the Liberal Party in Manitoba that came out first to say that uh, they would search the landfill site. It was the NDP who waited a few weeks to make that comment or make that, bit, yeah. that promise to, to cover half of the cost. Mm -hmm. $184 million, of course, famously oh. up to $184 million. Uh, uh, of course, Heather Stephenson has said she will not fund that due to concerns around health and safety, uh, which have been challenged in the media zone. But, yeah. Uh, the Liberal Party's really taken it upon themselves to be the forefront, uh, the, the, at the, the front of race r discussion, especially around child welfare. We had Dougal yes, Lamont on the yeah. podcast, uh, and the, and he said this selection is very much about race. Absolutely. Uh, wh why is the Liberal Party seem to be kind of almost more left to the NDP when it comes to discussing around issues of race? Well, I don't think it's necessarily productive to talk about reconciliation in terms of this is a left versus right thing. This is a Canadian thing. This is a Manitoban thing that we all have to deal with. We all should want to do right by the Indigenous communities here. And frankly, they have been let down. So when the Manitoba Liberals, as long as I've been involved, have positioned Indigenous voices if it comes to um, just consultation on policy proposals, if it, if it is our um, Indigenous council, whatever it is, we don't want to continue this colonial construct of, let me tell you what you need, First Nation people, Indigenous people, Métis, right? That is not productive. So when it comes to searching the landfills, it is an absolute no-brainer. I don't personally. It's not about the cost. Reconciliation is a responsibility that we have regardless of cost and that it was just frankly the right thing to do. And so I know for a fact that Dugald and everyone I speak to at the Manitoba Liberal Party know that this is um, a contentious issue that, you know, there is a lot of racism that still exists in Manitoba. And I mean, let's be honest, your conversation with my fellow panelists before, we can't say that making a First Nations man the face of violent crime in Winnipeg is not a dog whistle. It is. It is. Right? I mean, we can, we can argue that, but. As the candidate. Yeah. And, 
and we know because uh, you know well you, you've sort of been a politician no i mean as a senator you've never had to run for election but you've been very close and and aaron's run and when you're out there you're a dartboard you know yeah, but no isn't that what it. makes it such an inspiring story for young people who may be wondering like can I can I overcome the challenges that I have? Can I get past some of the things that maybe they've been involved with that they'd like to move on from? Wop's story is actually very inspiring that he did uh, make some bad decisions, but he turned his life around. And he's a great example of what we want if somebody gets on the wrong side. We want to see people turn their life around, become productive, become um, to reach their potential. So I think it just adds to being an inspiring story. I would also say just though that it seems, though, that uh, at what point does someone, uh, at, you know, they, we've seen time and time again, non-Indigenous people, particularly men who have run for office and who have been MPs and MLAs and uh, who have, I mean, no one talks about their criminal past. And it's at what point do you get to sort of escape or recover or rehabilitate uh, your image in the public eye? At, like, at what point, how many times do you have to talk about it? Until you come to a point where you've distanced yourself, is it decades? Is it is it is it at the at the end of your life? Oh, I'm, I'm saying I'm sorry. So far, I haven't heard him say that. He has said, "Yes, I have done bad things in my life." That's what I've heard him say. He has never said, "And I'm sorry that I did this or I did that." Why wouldn't he do that? I think that's one of the first things that we need to do. That's what's being done with every other reprehensible thing that we have now that's in the public eye is apologize. And yeah. Wab Canoe has yet to apologize. I, I can think of several uh, MP, male MPs who have criminal pasts who have never said, I'm sorry. And certainly they didn't face the kind of scrutiny and the kind of uh, approaches. But let's get on to uh, <laughs> discussing what is, I think the other most important issue for this election campaign, uh, something that is just coming up time and time again. We saw yet another uh, tax cut announcement today for the business tax amongst Heather Stephenson's conservatives. Uh, even the NDP is getting on board by talking about cutting gas tax, a uh, tax on gas. Uh, tax cuts seem to be the, the tone of the day after. Is that because of affordability? Is that the issue here? Um, you know, people are often talking about the carbon tax outside of Manitoba. And Heather Stephenson said that she would open up a court case to challenge the, the carbon tax again. I'm not sure that's on the public eye as much as people worried about their mortgage. Uh, Don, what's the uh, wh why is tax cuts being the, um, the carrying the tone of the day for? Well, uh, thank you for the for the question, and I need to try to remember that we're talking provincial politics here, not federal, and I'm yeah. <laughs> somewhat wearing both hats. But uh, as I said earlier, I just came back from from Quebec City and and our federal leader uh, made very clear what you just said uh, about uh, about affordability, uh, mortgages. Uh, we have 30-year-old uh, men and women living in their parents' basements because they cannot afford to buy a house because the cost of housing, uh, and, and certainly Manitoba has been somewhat sheltered from that. But when you look at other, other jurisdictions, uh, uh, across the country, the, the price of housing has escalated so much. And of course, the, the, uh, available money to us because of our taxes has, has shrunk. And now we have higher interest rates. Uh, yes, we have the carbon tax, which is a huge tax. Uh, something that is hurting more and more. So I think tax relief is something that everybody in this province, and I really believe that this election will be largely about the economy. I think much more than, than, than uh, racism and even health care. I think people are looking at the economy. I can't afford to get out of my house I, uh, or, or, or to get out of my parents' basement. And so I think that will be a large issue. So, Aaron, the, uh, the NDP is not immune from the siren call of tax cuts uh, uh, and or affordability measures. Uh, a, I would say, controversial freeze on hydro rates that uh, interveners at the PUB, the Consumers Coalition, uh, uh, criticized pretty heavily. Um, a, um, uh, a gas tax uh, uh, cut uh, for an interim period. Um, so why... 
like I think there's a lot of new Democrats who would say that, and I know because they told some told me they were surprised uh, to see here an NDP government uh, take these positions. So why, yeah, well, like why so much attention on tax cuts? Obviously, not as aggressive. The Tories have been very aggressive on tax cuts, but why, like, why would the NDP get involved in something like that? Well, I wouldn't say it's so much attention. I still think, I don't agree with Don. I think healthcare is the biggest issue with most people, but affordability is right there as well. So that comes into it, but it isn't just tax cuts for affordability. It's a whole package. It's making sure that the minimum wage raises, um, you know, substantially each, each, uh, each year. It's about making sure that hydro rates, I don't know about yours, but my hydro rates have soared in the last couple of years. Um, it's a whole package of affordability. So I think that, um, we certainly see them talking more about uh, education and healthcare, but people need to know that they can afford their mortgage. Mm-hmm. Like Don said, that they can, you know, the grocery store, everything's gotten more expensive. So if you can get a break in a couple of places, I think that's important. But it's an affordability package. It's not a package so that people who are millionaires can make more millions. Okay, so that that would be... Um, sort of the point, uh, uh, Hannah, I'll, I'll throw over to you. The Liberals also proposed uh, what they refer to as uh, progressive income tax change, uh, where they want a, a sliding scale, uh, where uh, they try to focus the majority of savings, uh, tax savings, on people at the lower end of the spectrum. And what I would sort of say the in the NDP proposal, it's across the board. So, you know, really you have to be, you get the biggest savings, the more gasoline you buy and the more hydro you use. That, that's, that's the, the, the economics. But that's not in, the entire package. I mean, there's going no, to be no, other but that's, in terms of the, factors. But in terms of the tax cuts, that's how we determine who benefits from them. You have to consume more to benefit more. In the, in the Tory tax cuts, you have to earn more. To get the full benefit of the of the tax cuts that the conservatives are proposing, now and it's really we haven't got all the details on the liberal proposal, but um, is there? It sounds as if there's a, a bit of a liberal concern that across the board tax cuts that the other parties are talking about that don't really help the people that are really having trouble affording the the cost of living. Yeah, no, I mean, I think. You know, Manitobans are practical, they're wise, they don't like this silly populism that um, some of these, you know, other parties are promising. Here, have some money. Look at the Stephenson government in the last few months before the election, right? Why aren't we in a better fiscal position? Even federal transfers. Healthcare should be in a better position it is. We are 3.5, we get $3.5 billion more now than when the PCs got elected. So why aren't we seeing that growth that they're saying that these kinds of tax cuts that benefit big property owners and the CF mall and, you know, why aren't we seeing this work? There is more money in the provincial government right now than there's ever been. But we also can't pretend like these tax cuts don't have an effect, right? We already talked about the policy alternatives um, analysis. There will have to be cuts with your tax cuts. That might make sense for the PCs, but for the NDP, I find that quite shocking. I find the gas tax, which is essentially a subsidy on a fossil on fossil fuel companies because Kenny already tried this in Alberta. Ford already tried this in Ontario. It does not lower the price of gas. It just gives these giant corporations our tax dollars and puts us all in a worse position. So um, I, I, while I was saying the thing about, uh, you know, Tory tax cuts, mostly helping people that earn more money. I kind of got, I got a bit of a death stare across the, the studio from Don. But so I'll, I'll put the question in a slightly, slightly fairer context, which is, but it, it generally speaking, you know, the property, the education portion of the property tax cut, um, the, uh, the uh, income tax bracket uh, reduction of 50%. Um, you know, the, the, I, I don't think it's controversial to say that the major, like the largest benefits go to people that earn more money. No, and it, yeah, but, and the, the, the people who earn more money, I'm going to suggest to you, we all feel the pinch 
of the higher cost of living. But I don't, uh, you know, I don't honestly believe that we all are suffering from an affordability crisis. It costs more money for all of us to live, but we can still afford, we, literally afford what we're paying. The five of us. Yeah, that's right. The five right. of us in this room. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. But, but the point is that these tax cuts are treating everybody like they're in an affordability crisis and not, there's a lack of attention. We should be focusing more on the people that really can't afford to buy food and can't afford to heat their homes. But we're not doing that. Is that Well, that I it? believe, Dan, on yeah. carbon tax, for example, I think we are. I think on, on us challenging uh, the, 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 the carbon tax, uh, for example, even on Manitoba Hydro, we now have a legal opinion uh, in our favor. And, and as a re-elected PC government, we will instruct Manitoba Hydro to immediately remove the carbon tax uh, from all Manitoba Hydro builds for the uh, within the first 10 days of us being in government. Oh, How yeah. does that not help every body that's paying a hydro bill. Aaron just talked about how high, how high the hydro bill was. That clearly right. helps everybody. But it, we're talking about the the high the carbon tax on hydro bills is really such a very small amount of money compared to the money that will flow to higher income earners from the income tax changes and in particular the education property tax uh bill which is you know, I mean sure, people with more expensive homes on larger lots pay more taxes. But that's a tax cut that just is disproportionately a benefit to to people who can afford to own well, larger homes. I think homes. when you use percentages, it is not disproportionate. But we're a also sending it out of the percentage. province to people who own Superstore. I mean, it's about <laughs> equity. The people who are hurting the most deserve the biggest break, not CF Polo Park. But I think Hannah said it really well, that the health transfers have been going to help people with tax breaks under... Under our government, the health transfers would go to helping health care. Well, you know, I mean, I think it, it is it is one of the problems of um, trying to compare parties that have records is that, <laughs> uh, you know, quite frankly, no, but I, I mean, like it is, there, there's no doubt that um, wait lists are longer now uh, for elective procedures, uh, but it's also impossible to ignore the fact that we lost two years. Uh, of uh, of being able to do electric procedures because of the pandemic. So I'm acknowledging that there's, you know, these things are factually fair and sometimes philosophically, you know, or metaphorically unfair. Well, uh, factual, you know. Factually, Dan, yeah. uh, our plan is already working with 1,100 new medical professionals hired, not going yeah. to hire, hired, so 70 <laughs> new or assistants and yeah. 150 new doctors on the way. So, Those but John, are things we, that we, try, we tried to get the health minister to give us the net number, i.e., you know, against the number of, that have left, either the nursing profession or the province, and we couldn't get the net number. So I don't dispute the, the net or the uh, gross positive, but we've never been able to get the net. Well, and there's a reason why the Manitoba Nurses Union has endorsed the NDP, because they believe that we are the ones that can get health care back on track. Well, we could all have reasons why the unions are endorsing the NDP, and uh, <laughs> what, this, you this is not the first election we, where that's happening. Nurses probably have a pretty good understanding of what's needed in health care. I'm not sure. Well, one well thing we're I, one all thing such I, a huge supporter of the nursing profession. <laughs> really, you know, I can just tell by all the smiles and nods oh. around the table. Um, <laughs> some, of us, the, some of us need them was, more okay, than but others. I, I'm going to, like, we're, we're getting sort of close to the end of our time. I was going to ask sort of for a question that allows everybody one last, you know, kick at the, at each other. No, kick at the can. <laughs> um, no, but it's, it's, if there's one issue that we haven't talked about yet that you would like to see become part of the, of the campaign, uh, an issue, not you know, issue of record of some other governing party, but, you know, an issue that you would like to see the parties debate, what would the issue be, Hannah? Um, gosh, I feel put on the spot. Can I go third? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to yeah. go yet. <laughs> no, it's, it's funny, you know, I asked the question, everybody started looking at the ceiling, like they didn't want to be called <laughs> on by the teacher. Go, first, go Don, please. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I'm happy right. to go first. Yeah. Parental yeah. rights. Oh, parental yeah. rights in the schools i am passionate about all right i believe i believe that as a parent as a grandparent uh, i want my son and my daughter-in-laws uh to have 
parental rights in schools. I think it's something that other provinces, this is something that's taking off across the country that Heather Stephenson has promised as well. It is enhancing what we've already had since 1996. It's legislative Since bullying. 1996, yeah, and, it's and, it's needs, it's and, and, and it needs and bullying. and it is not legislating bullying. It's not bullying. It's bullying we have in school because of social media. <laughs> there is more and more bullying. Bullying is on the increase right now. That is why we have children suicides because bullying is on the what increase. Exactly? A like, parent yeah, should have the right to be able to say, yeah, that's "You what I cannot." You cannot post that picture of my child on the internet. So it was interesting that I decided I wasn't going to bring up family values because it was going to double the amount of time that we needed for the podcast. But so the stuff that you've mentioned is actually pretty motherhoody stuff. Like I don't actually think there's anybody here that's going to disagree with the way you've described some of the issues. But Don, you know that the term parental rights has become a kind of a, a, it's a phrase that's being used by some very, very strongly opinionated uh, activist types. The people, for example, that went to the library board in Brandon, the school board in the Louis Rail School Division, and were protesting against specific content, but also uh, making claims that any materials that even acknowledge uh, the existence of uh, same-sex relationships or, uh, you know, anything related to LGBTQ was promoting criminal acts. And of so course, that, this has nothing to okay, do with no, 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 and I And I accept you at your word, except, I, you know, I, I also think, and when the Premier made the announcement, I giving her credit to for knowing that the term parental rights is being used in a, is also being used in a different context. Than, so you can't say parental rights, I would suggest, without also bringing some of that baggage into the term. How, how can oh, you? Oh, I think yeah. I can, Dan, because that's not what I'm speaking about. That's not what the premier spoke about. That's not what premiers in other provinces are speaking about. They are speaking about the rights of parents to have a say and how their child is being raised and taught in a school, whether it has something to do with, with, and, and, and you use the, 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 the term LGDP. Uh, I didn't. I am saying it has to do with anything that is being taught to my child in school. It, any disciplines that are being, uh, handed out to my child in school. Uh, I have the right to be on a, on a parent teacher association. Uh, that is what this is talking and, about. And do those people parents have, those parents have country, a right? People across the country, Dan, across yeah. the country, 80% of people across the country are in favor of having more parental rights in school. No, but parental rights to what end? So if one parent, for example, objects to a book in a library, do we remove the book? Is that a parent no, expression of parental first rights? Of all, first of all, that is not what our premier said. No, no, no. I'm just asking and, you and, in and your understanding. Is, no, of and that is not my understanding okay. of it. Any book that would be removed out of any school would have to be done through consul consultation, obviously with teachers involved, with professionals involved. But I would hope, I would hope that the parents would have a seat at that table. So, Aaron, it, is it? Can we? Is it possible to create a made in Manitoba definition of parental rights? No, We're, that's naive. And Don, you're not naive. You know what that stands for. And so does Heather Stephenson. And the thing is that parents do have rights. Parents have rights. Teachers have chosen the books that are in there already. This hasn't just been random books showing up in the library. But by saying parental rights, you are saying that we want to put kids back in the closet. We want to be allowed to hide people identity and go back to when people had to feel shame for who they are. And I'm horrified, actually, that Manitoba is even considering or having this conversation. So, Hannah, the um, is, is parental rights an issue, you know, because it obviously it's going to provoke some strong feelings. So is it an issue that you would like to see? discussed it's already formed a plank in the in the conservative campaign and you've heard uh, senator plett explain the context for which that what that was mentioned should should there be a deeper dive into this and more debate no absolutely not i think it is embarrassing that manitoba is now using these transphobic anti-lgbtq2s dog whistles and let's again not pretend it is anything 
other than that. That's the definition. That is the point of a dog whistle is having that deniability. I'm just going to go, because uh, again, I, I wasn't going to bring up family values because I... Uh, when no, you, but you did yeah. ask, what are you passionate about? Uh, and what, what issue and, needed to be... So I gave you my opinion. No, I want to thank you for bringing yeah. that up. No, uh, Aaron, uh, other issues other that you would like to um, see that we haven't discussed yet. I'd like to see those numbers that you talked about before. I'd like to see how many doctors have left and how many have you actually brought in? How many nurses did you get rid of? How many are actually here? Not just ones you're talking mm -hmm. about bringing, but well, I want to see the numbers so, because uh, I know that they're negative. Yeah. So the, the, the NDP. I would like to see those numbers too going back for the last. Oh, please. Seven. I'd love yeah, to share Yeah, no, 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 record. for sure. The uh, <laughs> former health minister. I would uh, love to share so, my record on nurses and doctors. Please, so, let's go there. But, you know, but it is true. Like we, we do have it's a it's an objective fact we have a shortage in a lot of critical areas of the healthcare system i would say the ndp has been talking a lot about recruitment and retention but to tell you the truth like i haven't i haven't really got the sense that other than an intention that anybody really knows well we do like, we did it before we well, did it before no, in 99 yeah, but, when they had okay. just but left Aaron, us this devastated. is not this is not then that was that was then and now, right now, we have seen like more than a thousand nurses leave the public system to work in the private system. So I think, honestly, anybody who suggests that they've got, they can just throw money at that no, and they're going to get not, those but nurses But the nurses back. union trusts us. That's why the nurses union has endorsed us because right. they believe that we are the party that will be able to bring back nurses. So is it just about, like I know they've talked about a, a more accepting culture. Uh, or in a more cooperative, respected collaborative, culture. respected culture. But again, you're talking about a thousand nurses that are working in the private sector. They're being paid better. They work fewer hours. Uh, like, honestly. Well, I, because yeah. they got so cut in the public sector. No, no, no. Sector. I'm not, but I'm just saying to assess the NDP promises, I need more than we're going to recruit these people and we're going to okay, put more well, money into it. We do know how to do this. We've done it before. And the nurses have put their faith in us. Oh, I think okay. that says... I think that says everything of who they think is going to do the best by nurses. Okay, but you would also accept that the the labor market dynamics around healthcare professionals now are pretty, on every every are way different than they every were profession okay. is struggling right now. Hannah, we've circled back around to you now. We've given you we allowed you to go last. <laughs> I appreciate uh, yeah, that, it. That's Thank no worry. You. Okay, issue that hasn't been discussed yet. I mean, I just think there's so many. I as I think. It's fair to say the youngest person in the room. I don't think that's a wrong. Oh, you're gonna assessment. use that one. Aren't you? I mean, yeah. what? Are you, 24, Dan? 24, wow. maybe, maybe. That's right. so oh I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. But yeah. I think that also gives me a unique um, hope for this province that I love so much, and there's so many exciting real, practical, doable things that we can do and accomplish in this election if we honestly grow up a little bit as every party leader and talk how we can work together. We talk about affordability. We talk about housing because we aren't. Okay, we talk housing, about the, yeah, yeah, we talk about the root problems of crime, not just make dog whistles or pretend it doesn't exist. Right. We talk about these things that Manitobans are actually facing and we don't just throw tax cuts at it or dog whistles. Right. I want to know how we are going to advance reconciliation. I want to know how we're going to build women's shelters for those fleeing violence. I want to know things that affect me and my peers and cut out the noise. That's that's what I'm hoping. Uh, we well, really rely on the noise. I don't know. What it is, but it's like, <laughs> Actually, the I know it runs on noise. Yeah, that's, that's too right. idealistic, uh, but, yeah, maybe. No, no, I, uh, it's fine, I just want to say, you know, uh, it's been hard to get a word in to try to uh, but that's also the sign of a great panel and everyone's very passionate. And, and uh, if there's anything that marks this Manitoba election is interest. Uh, it's something that this is probably the most interesting election, certainly in my lifetime, going back to the 90s anyways, where uh, you're seeing great passion for the province and, and vision. And certainly at a time period uh, that's very pivotal for the province. Uh, we want to thank all of you for coming out and spending time here at the Neon Lone Ranger podcast. And uh, we want to just... Appreciate all the work that you do in the different circles and streams that you work in. Uh, miigwech to Aaron Selby, uh, Don Plett, and Hannah Mahaychek Marshall for coming out and spending time with us uh, and coming down to the CJNU studios.
Miigwech to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I was keeping score here on my, but there were no, nobody dunked on anybody. It was, uh, it was <laughs> close. <laughs> there were, there were, a, there were a couple, there were a couple of layoffs that were blocked at the rim. <laughs> Like where they everybody somebody thought they were going in for and then no you guys listen you guys were great and like the thing is it's it's hard to bring together uh, people who are knowledgeable and passionate about politics without having a little little throwdown but I, I think you guys like thank you very much for sort of keeping it you know keeping it real and we'll take reasonable. it out back now yeah, yeah. That's, right. <laughs> that's right that's right it's the it's the podcast after hours uh, I was the smallest guy on the ice Dan I had to play with my elbows up oh <laughs> yeah well. And, and you uh, here you, I meet two very powerful women. No, I have that, to do the same thing. Absolutely, you, you, yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, you, right. yeah. You you haven't lost that talent. Though. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.